The Cranky Geek WebRTC Spring 2021 show is possible thanks to our sponsors. Google, Agora, Element, Dolby I.O., Twilio, and Ring Central. See the links in the description for more information. Everyone, we're in the last session of the event before the breakout rooms, and with me is Jan Skoglund from Google, and he's going to discuss, to talk about Lyra. For me, that's a very interesting topic because it's a very new codec that just came out. So Jan, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. All right, as Syed said, uh, my name is Jan Skoglund, and I'm here to talk about speech codec that we just developed. And luckily for the world, we open sourced it. Uh, you might think, well, why do we need uh, low rate speech coding at this age? Because uh, uh, video would, and we have good, we have good communication around, and video would probably eat most of the bandwidth. So there, 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 there's nothing left, or or not left. There is nothing much uh, for compressing speech, right? Why, why do we need, why do we need to do that? But that is not really true because lately we've seen that there is a communication problem. Uh, for example, m many uh, mobile users are still on 2G networks. Uh, that's quite a lot, one and a half billion people. And the same number, and even a little bit more, are on 3G networks. So they have a little, very little uh, bandwidth available for both audio and video. And another thing is these unlimited data plans uh, that are, you have a high data rate, but then you max out, and then you throttle to 64 kilobits per second. And 64 kilobits per second, that means there's like a 30 kilobits left for audio and video and even less. So, and another thing that came up this year is this, when you work from home or anywhere, you will see even in the best networks, there will be these kind of dropouts and you wish like uh, during five minutes that if you could just switch to a low rate coder during this uh, uh, urgent time, so that would be best. So it, it is actually a real problem. and. Uh, the question is like the science question we can have here is like okay, all right, what what is the lowest we can do then? How low can you go if we can just give all all the efforts in the world? So this is something that people thought about already in the fifties, and uh, so we're thinking about it, like you have uh, a speech, but you have a speech recognizer that converts it into a text stream like ASCII text, or and then. And also some other things like who's talking and what mood that guy is or woman. And then also like if intonation, if like you know, what, um, what do you want? Like, like emotions go up and down. And then on the other side, you take this text and these kind of metadata about the mood and you just generate speech. That is kind of the ultimate low bitrate codec. And the early estimate from the 50s were, was that... Uh, that you can do this, but for English, you could do it around 50 bits per second. Uh, and uh, a more recent estimate, uh, because this com comes up now again, because it, it becomes a, an interesting problem again, is that it's around 100 bit, um, bits per second. It's if you want to squeeze out everything and then just start transmit it. The problem with these uh, limits are, uh, are that they need very long delay and sometimes infinite to channel. That means that it's not very practical in a two-way communication like a voice over IP or conferencing. So practical speech coding, uh, basically there are two classes. And the ones that are really low go to really low bit rates. Uh, the ones that are basically I talked about in the previous slide and the ones I'm going to talk about today are called parametric codecs or sometimes called vocoders. That is that they are speech synthesizers. There is, is an oscillator that generates speech waveform. And you, you transmit not the waveform itself, you transmit settings for this uh, uh, synthesizer of how to produce a speech sound. And by doing this, you can just be very efficient because you just have to send over these parameters and you can quantize them quite hard. So you get very low bit rates. You can go down to 300 uh, for the very uh, typically and up to and they work up to about five five kilobits per second. Sorry, the reason why we typically don't go higher is that these uh, these these are these coders are completely limited to the model. 
after a while, you can give them as many bits as you want. But in the end, it's just you are limited by the synthesis, uh, the speech synthesizer. That means that it doesn't really matter how many bits you set. The problem in the past is that these sound pretty robotic, but very intelligible. So they have only they're, they're used only today at very like narrow bands in um, speech uh, applications like secure communications, where you have very few bits for the actual speech channel, and most of the bits go to uh, encryption. So the other class, there is another class, luckily, they are waveform match encoders. You're trying. You're not trying to, uh, to mimic the sound. You're actually trying to mimic all the output samples. So you give you give it bits to uh, to mimic and try to follow the speech waveform. And the good thing with this is that the more bits you give to it, the better it comes. And of course, if you give it infinite bits, it will be infinite quality. So that's the good thing with waveform coders. The problem is that they break down because it's very very low bit rate. They can't really reproduce the speech waveform as well. Uh, at low bit rates, but so, they have, sorry. And and today in voice over IP, it's like most of the codecs would be waveform based or parametric based. Good question. Today in voice over IP, the typical uh, more uh, I guess in wave, voice over IP in conf conferencing, uh, I would mm -hmm. say all of them are using uh, waveform yes. encoders, even like Opus or AMR narrowband, even if they are. They have some models in there. They're in the end. In the end of the day, they're trying to match the waveform. So, mm -hmm. but they're used in a rate that is good for them. So, like uh, Opus, typically right now when we talk in here, it's like 32 kilobits per second. It's almost transparent, and it sometimes um, in other in other type of web scenarios, you go down to 10 maybe. So this is good. But now, if we want to go even lower, these these guys can't do it. The only thing we can do then is like look at these traditional parametric coders, uh, but they don't sound so good. And so the question is now: Can we do better parametric coding? Can we have better synthesizers for these uh, these uh, features that uh, the parameters that we send? And the question is: Yes, thanks to the new uh, AI uh, that reemerges. I mean, well, there was AI for speech uh, processing in the past, but now that we have more powerful systems. We can actually do something useful. And a couple of years ago, DeepMind introduced WaveNet. It's a, it's a speech synthesizer, text-to-speech, which we had remarkable quality using just a deep network and where we produce one sample at a time, and that sample got fed back into the system and controlled by some other features, uh, uh, synthesized uh, like speech uh, language and sound features, and it could produce fantastic yeah, quality. It has high quality, uh, high quality, but that the prices that you see these deep networks, it's pretty high uh, complexity, which was fine for experimenting and also the, the targeting cloud computing where, where you have data centers that can work. But, and we were looking into, maybe we can do this, we can use these kind of synthesizers, these really good uh, oscillators to, to generate speech. The problem is that there are some differences already from the outset. Uh, we we are not going to generate features from from text. We're actually going to extract them from recorded speech. That's one thing that's different. And then also we need it to work for more spe uh, speakers. Not not only the few speakers that you typically have in a text to speech system where you train for just a few voices. This at the phone should work for everyone. So th so we try to look into that problem. Those two problems first with a WaveNet as a synthesizer. And we had a research experiment that went very well. We, we drove WaveNet with parameters extracted from a parametric coder called Codec2. And that was coded at 2.4 kilobits per second. And we managed to make a, a coder that sounded fantastic or really, really good for those conditions. So uh, that kind of spurred us uh, further, like maybe we can do something practical about this, uh, these things. The problem, of course, first is that uh, is that WaveNet is is astronomically complex. So first of all, we need to get reasonable complexity so we put it on a phone because that that's uh, what, for instance, Duo wanted it uh, to work, work on a phone. And luckily, there are better since WaveNet was introduced. There are newer uh, architectures that are more efficient. 
So first, you re we replace the WaveNet with a, with a, something called a GRU, which is a recurrent network that is much more efficient. Secondly, we uh, call a sparse model, meaning that we, we, we don't use all the, the weights in the network. We just use a few in a smart way. And the, sec and the third thing that we did was to generate a couple of samples at the same time. Like we do four samples at a time. So this uh, doesn't have to operate as, uh, as, as often as uh, you, uh, a, another one would do. So we, we, instead of taking one sample at a time, we, we produce four samples at a time. That's the complexity. Another thing that's different from TTS is that TTS is targeting high quality studio recorded speech. And the same thing we did, uh, we, we did in, in, it, in our first experiment. But in real life, you have background noise. So you really need to, to take care of that. And what we did to combat that was, first of all, we use features that were more kind of diverse. So we figured out we need spectral features that the entire time frequency spectrum is better to use for this. And then the last thing we did was something recently we found that if you train with noisy speech, you get noisy speech, even if you don't want it. So we introduced a, a, a loss as uh, so we penalize unwanted noisiness when we train the network. And that gave us, in the end, a Lyra codex that operates at 16 kilohertz sampling frequency and uses 40 milliseconds frame rate update and 80 milliseconds frame size. And we quantize at 3 kilobits per second. So it's a parametric codec? that uses AI to reconstruct the part of speech to text, so to say. Yes. So instead of generate, instead of, ex so I can, can look here. So a generate, here is how it operates. A generative model, like, so, uh, that's the synthesizer. It takes some speech features and produces a speech waveform. That's those speech features. We are not generating them from text. We are extracting them from uh, input speech. So you look at the left there, we take input speech as a time waveform. We extract features that are spectral features. It's like time frequency uh, image here. You can see uh, frequency uh, in the vertical direction and time in the horizontal. Then we quantize them. We may basically make them into a bit stream and then use this to drive this generative model, which is like a speech synthesizer. And since it's a parametric coder, it will produce a waveform, not exactly the same waveform, because we are not trying to mimic the waveform. If you look carefully, the input and the output, the waveforms are not exact. They are similar because they produce the same speech sounds, but they have no, they have no intention of being exactly the same thing. But they sound pretty, pretty good. OK. So we made this thing uh, open source. At, and we put it at GitHub. We put it there as a, as a library with a regular API. It's very easy to wrap it into WebRTC. The reason we didn't, um, we didn't open source our wrappers was because we, our wrappers are very heavily tailored for Duo. Uh, and it's not very generic. So it will, and we felt like that would take some extra time to just to make the generic ones for the world. Where, when, since especially in this community, uh, I think most people there know how to make a wrapper, like I have here, um, how to call Lyra from, from WebRTC. So, after this, what, what are we planning to do next? Yeah, the, the first thing we want to do is right now, Lyra works in real time on slightly high end phones, like all the Pixels and the higher end Samsungs. We wanted to work on bit more than that. So we're trying to, do, to reduce the complexity a little bit more on our side to enable more devices. We are also looking into kind of um, presenting a, a Lyra or making it operate at several more bit rates so that we can enable more use cases, not only these emergency super low bit rates. Uh, that uh, is more of a long-term project that will take some time because it's really, really now focused on low bit rates with this synthesis model. We're working on it. And another thing that we noticed is even though we train with noise and make a, a good model that can, can uh, uh, robust with that, after a while, if there's too much noise, uh, it breaks down. 
uh, less so than waveform coders. Uh, however, uh, putting a denoiser in front of it, it makes really good uh, quality. So we're considering putting a low complex, low complexity denoiser as a pre-processing stage, and hopefully maybe open source that one too. But another thing with open sourcing is, of course, we want community contributions, and this we've, we've been open source for just a short while, and there are already been really good contributions from the community. So thanks for that, and I'm uh, open for questions, I guess. Tranky Geek is possible thanks to Google, as well as industry sponsors. Agora, embed vivid voice and video in any application, on any device, anywhere. Dolby, the API platform for transforming media and communications. Element, talk to everyone through the open global matrix network, protected by proper end-to-end -end encryption. Ring Central, revolutionize your business communications with Ring Central APIs. Twilio, create real-time video apps that scale as you grow from free one-to-one -one chats to larger group rooms.